Introducing... The Daredevils of Hollywood. All right, everybody. Ready to take this scene? Hey, Juicer, give me a yellow spot on that building. We got four cameras set up at the point of the crash, Mr. Andrews. How about the truck? Yeah, we'll make a follow shot with the camera car. Hey, Eddie, get all those people off the streets. We're going to take it. Now, look, Lou. I asked Mr. Andrews. Here's your scene. You're supposed to drive this big gasoline truck with a trailer down this steep hill, and when you get to the bottom of the hill, the whole works turns over. You get the idea? Yep. You see, the truck is supposed to be out of control. When it piles up, it catches on fire. The way the story goes, you get thrown clear. Thrown clear, eh? Well, that's nice. Okay, I'm all set. Well, all right, everybody. Here we go. It's a take. Okay, camera up. Hey, look at that thing drop off that hill. Yeah, this is going to be good. He's doing at least 65. Look at that bus travel. It's almost to the bottom. Here's the crash. Watch out. From Hollywood, the motion picture capital of the world, we bring you the thrilling true life experiences of those men behind the scenes. Those daring unsung heroes whose breathtaking adventures on the screen have thrilled millions. Whose daily jobs bring them face to face with death. Those men who comprise the strangest fraternity on earth. The Suicide Squad. The movie stuntmen. The Daredevils of Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, in bringing you this copyrighted radio feature, we are privileged to have as our guest one of the leading stuntmen of Hollywood, Bob Clark. It is through his cooperation that we are able to reenact some of the highlights of his dangerous profession. The thrilling scenes you are about to hear are his own actual experiences. Bob Clark is here in the studio right now, and later in the program we will bring him to the microphone. But first, let's follow him through a routine day before the cameras. Seated in the lobby of a hotel in Prescott, Arizona, we find three men in conversation. These three men, each with an important role in the manufacture of a forthcoming motion picture. One is a director, one his assistant, and the other, Bob Clark, ace stuntman and double for Tom Mix. Let's listen. Bob, I want you to meet my director. Mr. Perry, this is Bob Clark, the stuntman I was telling you about. Glad to know you, Mr. Perry. Hello, Bob. Say, I've heard plenty about you. Yeah? I've heard a lot about you, too, about winning the Academy Award last year and all that. Oh, well, that was just a lucky break. Oh, yeah? Well... What's this picture all about? It's doubling for Tom Mix. Now, here's the general idea. The story brings in a rodeo. It seems that Tom Mix and the boys from his ranch have won every event, you see? The star performers, eh? That's it. The heavy and his gang are framed up about this. They want to win something. Now, the last and final event is a stagecoach race across open country. I see. A thrilling run to the finish. Yep, and here's the finish. They come across the country to the racetrack, through the gate, and around one lap. I see. Very good. But what's the stunt? Well, the heavy and his gang see that they can't win the race, so they rig up a big pole at the gate. It's just high enough to allow the horses to pass under, but it hits the coach and tears it to splinters. Hey, this is getting to be all right. Now, here's what you're supposed to do. Naturally, you're driving this coach that gets smashed up. So, as you near the pole, you leap into the air, over it, and land on a specially built platform right above the double tree. Okay. And then what happens? Well, the coach goes into a thousand different pieces while you ride the front wheels and the team on around the track to come in first. Well, Bob, what do you think of that? To tell the truth, Glenn, I think someday these script writers are going to reach their objective. Yeah, and what's that? Someday, some way, they'll figure out a way to break a stunt man's neck. Time for the big scene is almost at hand. Bob Clark is now on the location set. And the old abandoned racetrack is buzzing with activity. Hundreds of people mill about, some adjusting the studio equipment, others waiting their cues. But all are keenly aware of the danger of the next scene. A man's life is at stake, and this they cannot forget. Finally, a warning whistle is heard, and the director's voice rises sharply above the din. All right, everybody, we're going to take this scene now. Get all those coaches lined up. Camera car's all set, Mr. Perry, and we've got four tripods on the track. That's well, Glenn. Now, listen, you fellas. Bob Clark is supposed to come in first. And look, Bob, when you hit that pole over the gate, make it look good. Hit it hard. You bet I will, Mr. Perry. Don't worry. How about it? 
Everybody ready? Okay, here we go. Camera. All right, boys, take it away. Well, they're off to a nice start. Say, that looks good. Yeah, it'll make a beautiful scene. Yeah. Look at the background against those coaches. Well, off in third place. Watch him. He'll start coming up soon. Yeah, that's just the way I want it. There he comes. He's passing one of them. Say, this is almost as good as a horse race. <laughs> He's still coming up. Yeah, they're rounding the hill down there. They're coming toward the racetrack. Boy, look at those horses run. Yeah, Bob's trying to pass the lead coach. And neck and neck. There he goes. He's in the lead. And headed straight for the gate. Holy smoke, that heavy pole across the gap is as big as a telephone pole. Well, he certainly ought to wreck the coach at that speed. Yeah, we'll know about that in a minute. Here he comes. Get away from that gate, then. Get away from there. He's standing up on the seat. He's getting ready to jump. I hope he makes it. Man, what a speed. There he goes. Look at that guy sail through the air. He, he landed right on the platform. Perfect time. Yeah, and there he goes around the track with nothing but two front wheels. Yeah, and look at the rest of the coach. There's not a piece big enough to recognize. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to present the courageous young man who made that scene, who makes hundreds of dangerous scenes for motion pictures, whose job it is to cheat death, Bob Clark, interviewed by Glenn Hardy. Well, Bob, that certainly was some stunt, and I'd say you must have been pretty thrilled yourself. Yes, I, I was. That jump over the pole had to be timed to the split second. What would have happened if you'd missed the little platform built on the front wheel? It would have been curtains, I guess. <laughs> I see. Bob, I'd suppose that you've had a lot of close calls in your day. Tell me, what would you say was the tightest spot you were ever in? Well, that's a hard question to answer. There have been hundreds of tight spots, but I remember one when we were making Arizona Ames for Paramount. It was one of Zane Gray's stories with Monty Blue. I got in a spot there that I still don't understand how I got out of. It was on location up at Big Bear. Uh, we were Bob, all... wait a minute, Bob. We're about to forget something. We'll hear another thrilling dramatization in just a moment, but first... A word from the firm who has made this program possible, our sponsor. Okay, Bob, now what about that tight spot? Well, it so happened that the character I was playing had a very dangerous stunt to do. The director, Jack Rowland, and Hal Walker, his assistant, were explaining to me uh, what was to be done, and so... <clears throat> now, this will give you some idea of the stunt, Bob. You see, Mr. Blue is supposed to be a prospector. You're his friend. Well, he tries to build a railroad to the mine so he can chip out his ore. Get the idea? Yeah, but the outlaws won't let him build the track. They stop him at every attempt. I see. So then what happens? The result is he has to haul the ore over about 30 miles of rough mountain road in wagons. It's a slow process, you see. And here's where you come in, Bob. You and Monty are each driving a wagon filled with ore. And the outlaws shoot Monty off his wagon, and the horses run away. And what do I do? They shoot you off, too, and you're supposed to fall off the rig. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't really fall off. You fall into a little cage that we've had built specially for the purpose. It's down in the bottom of the wagon near the front wheels. Then you're supposed to make the horses look as if they're running away. There's a little peak hole there that you can see through. So far, so good. Now, here's the gag. You're making all these winding turns, and some of them are pretty sharp. But when you come to the straight place in the road there, turn the wagon over. See what I mean? It's practically done, Mr. Rowland. Well, then we're ready to go. How about it, Hal? Yes, sir, we're all set. All ready, everybody. This is a take. On your toes. Fire, please. This is it. Places, everybody. All right, boys. Get up on your wagons and let's go to town on this. Okay, go ahead, Marty. Right behind them, Bob. All right, roll them. Okay, on, Bob. Come on. That's good. There goes, Monty. Yeah, nice fall. And look at those horses take off. There goes, Bob. He made the cage all right, yeah. Horses, too. Watch him run. Hey, look at him take those turns. That looks plenty good enough for me. Now get this, man. Look at that sharp turn he's coming to. He'll never make it at that speed. Look, something's gone wrong with the wagon. The front end fell off. Yeah, the horses are loose. The wagon's going over the bank. Look at that. Well, Bob, I must admit I don't understand how you ever got out of that spot. I wouldn't have if the front part of the wagon hadn't broken off. That's the only reason the horses didn't fall on me. Well, why do you suppose something went wrong with the wagon, Bob? That often happens. You see, those wagons and buckboards they use in scenes like that have generally been crashed several times. Yes. Uh, they're repaired, of course, but they aren't as strong as they should be. Say, Bob, how many times have you been hurt doing stunts? Oh, dozens of times. Well, did you ever think of quitting? A lot of people have asked me that. 
No, I have no reason to quit. I like the stunt business and the dough. <laughs> well, they tell me that when a stunt man quits and comes out of retirement to do another stunt, it's usually his grand finale. What about that? It's a funny thing, but it seems to work out that way. I've known several stuntmen who quit and later came back only to crack up. Well, how do you feel about your future fate, Bob? Well, I guess it's all in the cards. If I'm supposed to go tomorrow, I'll go. Whether I'm a stuntman, a plumber, or a radio announcer. Uh oh I walked right into that one. <laughs> but how do you arrive at your conclusion? I've seen enough to convince me. For instance, I've known stuntmen who did everything humanly possible in the way of stunts for 20 years or more. And then finally developed pneumonia and go out in a few days. Well, Bob, who knows? There may be something in what you say. But at least there's no doubt at all that we've enjoyed your visit. On behalf of our listeners, I want to thank you for coming here. I know that everyone joins me in hoping that we may have you on this program again and very soon. Goodbye, old man, and the best of luck. <laughs> Thank you.